Close Encounters of the Third Kind is a signature classic UFO and alien contact movie directed by Steven Spielberg, released in the United States on November 16th, 1977. It was revolutionary for its time, with nothing else in comparison at all and especially for the ufo topic it was loaded with so many aspects and nuances of the ufo mystery that it has become a beacon and a must-see movie for ufo researchers old and new alike but in the 46 years since its premiere what has become known about the scenario it portrays is it really more of a documentary than a movie hello and welcome to this episode of mysteries with a history where you'll be taken on a wild ride into the unknown the strange and the mysterious like you i have questions and like you i want answers and with each episode together we will peel away the layers to look for the truth let me bring in my co-host jimmy church of fade of black radio and you know what he is starting the show right you know what he's doing he's eating ramen backstage that's the only way to prep for the show don't you think jimmy <laughs> I was trying to give you some extra time to like finish man, that. I'm munching, I'm munching. She's not can look, man. I got a big bowl of ramen. Big bowl of ramen. Can't yeah. go wrong with that. I, you know, it's it's it, it. I'm gonna be straight with you, Christina. It's how I prep for the show. It it it's it's just a tradition. And Thursday rolls around, and I you know, and I've got I've, I've got my thing. And if I don't do it, I feel guilty. I carry the burden. I carry the burden, and then then do do uh, I've only done this. Okay, can I confess? And then let's roll into this. It's going to be a great show. Let me make a confession. We've been doing this show for a long time, right? I I, I don't know when we started. Uh, hopefully, we'll never end, and all of that. But the tradition of ramen goes back to the very very beginning. There has been a couple of shows. When I didn't eat ramen. And for whatever those reasons are, and I might have faked it on the show. Yeah, yeah, I might I might have because of the guilt. I don't want the guilt. I don't want to carry the burden of, of that. But, yeah, it, it's a tradition, and, and I'm going for it. Now, um, this is a, a very – I ask this question every week, but th this week is very important. And uh, I wanted to ask you about this on the phone uh, when we were talking, and, and I didn't. I wanted to save it for the show. I want it fresh. What the heck – what 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 brought this on? Close Encounters of the Third Kind is a movie that needs to be consistently revisited. And it's one that I've only watched twice, to be absolutely honest. I've only seen it twice. And this was my third time watching it last night. Uh, you know, it in the 20 something years I've been alive, right? Right. But when I when I was watching it again, I was thinking. There are so many hidden little nuggets that I think have surfaced uh, significantly since 2017, where this conversation is no longer taboo. But during that time frame, 1977, it was just merely a sci-fi movie, haha, -ha, fun, giggles, entertainment. But after watching a few interviews uh, that Steven Spielberg did talking about the movie, he mentioned that he didn't want to make it science fiction. He wanted to make it science speculation. And I found that really compelling to the point of saying, not only do I want to rewatch the movie and do a slight review, but also look at all of the aspects, the nuances that have, that portrayed themselves in the film and what stories they are very familiar with, that we are very familiar with in the topic of UFOs and the UFO phenomenon. Because there are a few pieces that we're going to cover but when I was watching it again yesterday, I was like, that reminds me of this case. That reminds me of that case. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Spielberg, he's on top of his game. Like, he knows what he's doing. And so that is kind of the long-winded answer to your question. Okay. Uh, but, uh, yeah, okay, that was, that was a great answer. But was there something that uh, that clicked that made you think about Close Encounters this week? Yes. Okay. That yeah. that's that's the answer I'm looking for. What was that? Devil's Tower. 
in Wyoming. Did you go? No, but I'd like to. I'm I am mapping out all the places I want to go when I get the uh, RV and document gotcha. everything paranormal and UFOs in the United States. So I was looking at pictures and I'm like, oh my gosh, Devil's Tower. Oh my goodness, the movie. I mm -hmm. need to rewatch it. Okay. Now you need to uh because I did the same thing this week, and I can't believe you said that. Um, I went back and rewatched uh for the third time, by the way. Uh, Wes Anderson's new film, uh, Asteroid City. And it's it's typical Wes Anderson. It's fantastic. It's amazing. It's a great script and, and uh, great character development and everything. But there is a nod to Steven Spielberg in this movie. And it's Devil's Tower. So when you're watching it, um, uh, they're in the background is a devil's tower shaped i mean it's devil's tower it's a nod obviously it's 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 what uh, wes anderson is doing here right but um it is prominent in in so many scenes it's always in the background it's always there it's always there it's always there and i was sitting there thinking to myself i i got to go i gotta go to devil's tower i cannot believe i want to do the same hike Right, that Richard Dreyfus did oh. <laughs> and, uh, with um, uh, Melinda Dillon, and I think she just recently passed too, as well. But um, her, her, uh, we're going to get to Melinda in just a second. Uh, she plays uh, Jillian um, in the movie. But anyway, that hike that they do, right, and they come around the side and they look. Down. I'm going to do that hike. You know, I know that was in the studio and everything, but I just kind of want to see if I can replicate that. So, yeah, I want to go to Devil's Tower, and I thought about that this week. My my take, let me, I'm not going to do a long-winded one. I'm going to give you the very short version of it. When the rumors started about this movie coming out, right, and there was a lot of talk, and the talk was, Oh my God! The 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 flying saucers are so realistic. The the ET craft and and what Spielberg has achieved here. This is cinematic history, and it's a first time. And it's a, the build up, right? <clears throat> so I go to the theater, and mind you, it's nineteen seventy seven. So I'm I'm twelve, right? Thirteen, something like that. And I go to the theater, and I see it. And I'm waiting for the the what everybody's talking about. And so in each scene of the movie, like the first one when they're on the country road in Muncie, Indiana, and and you know, and the quick flyby and everybody's waiting for it. That's at the beginning of the um, was that it? Oh, that was pretty cool. Was that it? I wonder if that was it. Then there's this scene with him at the mailbox. Is that the is that what everybody's talking about? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Okay, all right. Was that it? Not sure. Gets to another scene. There's something else. And then was that it? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and you get to the end of the movie. And then, you know, and then all the little mini crafts are coming by. And that's pretty cool. Right. I'm like, is that it? Is that it? And then the big one. Right. Right. And, well, and the, it the, comes out. Blew the, the my movie. mind. But uh, Christine, it blew my mind. It blew it way beyond my expectations. And and it was that it, for him to do that in 1977 for a film that stands up to this day is is a is a huge feat. He pulled it off. But the other part about the film, again, very briefly very briefly, is that the story, the story holds up. And and now, today, it's, it's regarded as one of the greatest films of all time. Not science fiction, just period. It's in the Library of Congress. It's, it's gotten every award, the American Film Institute. I'll get to all of that in a second. But that's the other part of the film. You get the visual. But it's the story that Stephen told that has stood up to the test of time. 
I like that answer. For those watching this live, there is a poll up on YouTube that asks the question, was close encounters of the third kind a major influence on your interest in the UFO topic? 28% says, yes, it started my interest. 34% say, yes, brought validity to my interest. 8% say, no, I haven't seen it yet. Go watch it. And 30% say, no, just good entertainment. So please really? answer that poll. Hit wow. the like button if you are enjoying this so far. We have a lot to get into because yes. I want to share my screen here of one of the scenes that I found. There's a lot of scenes, but one of the first scenes that I found really profound was this one. Let's pull it up right here. Here it is. And this is when two pilots are talking to the command center, to, to traffic control, and saying, I'm seeing something really weird in the sky. Are you seeing it on your radars? And they're, they're saying, no, we're not seeing anything. And then one of them asks, do you want to report a UFO to one of the pilots? The pilot says no. He asks the other pilot, because it was more than one witness. He asks the other pilot, do you want to report a UFO? The pilot says no. During this time frame in 1977, there was a lot, a lot of stigma. And your job could very easily be on the line if at that time you were to report something like this. And a really, really great example is the very famous, the Japanese Airlines cargo flight 1628, that UFO incident that took place in 1986. We've covered it before. I would like to cover it again to give people kind of a foundation on how significant it is that if you are to report a UFO, your wings will be stripped and you will have an office job. That's not the case anymore. Ryan Graves is really pushing for that, being an advocate for pilots to confidently report their UFO sightings. But for a long period of time, pilots see them and they are just too scared to report them. Another great example are the Foo Fighters back in World War II. And that was that whole kind of fiasco thing that we've also covered here. But Jimmy, give us kind of the, the rundown of this very famous cargo flight 1628. It's not 1628, which is great. It's the, the line. No, no. It's the no. line that they say in this. Oh, don't in this me. scene, which goes back to Japan cargo, right? Uh, this is Indianapolis Ground Control. Do you wish to report a UFO? Right? That line is classic. Uh, no. Uh, United Flight uh, United Flight uh, 643, do you wish to report a UFO? No. <laughs> Delta Flight 1622, do you wish to report a UFO? No. Right. And th that is, is it's, I think it is what Spielberg did over and over um, in this movie was took real life examples of situations like this and put it in the movie, which made it not only uh, for it to seem more realistic, but to those that are not part of the community, are seeing what what is 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 done and how we put up with it and what we put up with and what pilots deal with, uh, what you know flight control centers all across the country are, are confronted with this all the time, probably daily, and uh, and that was it. Indianapolis Ground Control wished to report a UFO. Nope, and hopefully that stigma is removed. Um, and yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, with uh, the Japanese cargo flight, that pilot who did the right thing, and we had we had uh, the FAA radar, uh, the radar data. We had a ground control. We had the military bases. We had the pilot. We had the co-pilot. Everything was there. Right. And to the point where uh, the district manager of the FAA at that time, he he calls a day. He goes to Washington and he wants answers. It was like that. And he went public with this. He went public at the UFO hearing at uh, the, the press club and talked about this case. What happened to that pilot? He was grounded. He was grounded for doing the right thing. Now, he was grounded for about a year. 
He did get back up in the air, okay? But they did put him behind a desk. And that's why pilots say, nope. For that reason. It's- pilots fly because they love to fly, right? And and they dream about, just like me, I just... I wasn't good enough in math, right? I was whatever. I just wasn't smart enough. But but I dreamed of becoming a pilot, and we all do. And once you do become a pilot, you're flying a plane. That's you know that's that's the the dream gig, and and to get grounded, to get your wings clipped, no, for doing the right thing. And and that was the sad part about uh, J A L. And that cargo flight, all he did was, is, you know, and, and can you imagine, uh, let, we'll move on to, to another scene. Oh, I, I do want to get to a, a slight, a, a slow read, a, a quick read of, of, of the cast members um, uh, for everybody. Um, uh, is that, can you imagine seeing a walnut sized mile wide UFO? All casually flying. With cargo, no, it it would make me probably throw up right then and there. If <laughs> yeah, if I wasn't probably, probably probably fascinated with the UFO phenomenon, like if I was just your average person not familiar with the topic, I would I would throw up Blah! right then yeah. and there. Yeah. Up, Chuck, yeah. all my breakfast, <laughs> all my ramen. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, let me uh, just really quick because we're going to be talking about. Um, uh, characters and things. Um, uh, we have uh, Spielberg uh, likes to repeat um, stars in his movies. He does this all the time. And of course, we, uh, here we have Richard Dreyfus, who was also in Jaws and 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 other things. But uh, at that time, as Roy Neary, um, I thought he played the part uh, perfect. He's just a blue collar a uh, county worker there in uh, uh, Indianapolis, uh, specifically Muncie, Indiana, which is a suburb right outside of uh, Indianapolis. Um, Francis Tr- uh, Truffaut as as Claude Lacombe, uh, who was loosely based, and I say more accurately, uh, laser-focused based on Jacques Vallée and, and his research. Um, Terry Gar in one of her first films, by the way, as Roy's wife, uh, Ronnie. And I got to tell you, their relationship and what they go through at the beginning of the film, to anybody that's ever been married or married with children, it stresses me out to watch it. It just stresses me out to watch him cry, uh, you know, and she breaks in and he's in the bathtub and all those scenes and the kids crying and how Spielberg got kids to cry at over dinner. Those were, those were scenes where Roy is going through the trauma when he makes the mashed potatoes, uh, devil's tower at the dinner table and, and everybody just losing it and he's losing it. And Terry and the stress of the, of the marriage, um, yeah, uh, Terry Garb uh, was just fantastic. Yeah, there it is. That's that's well, <laughs> he gets that bowl of potatoes and he's taking the fork, right, and doing the stripes up the side, and and his son starts crying and he's crying, and uh, it's just uh, it's one of the great scenes in cinema. And uh, thank you for grabbing <laughs> the it instant is. potatoes. I- yeah, and he he was a great choice for the casting. This scene was very emotional, but just right before the scene of just talking about emotion, just I'll make this very brief. When he's in the shower with all of his clothes on, his wife yeah. comes in, breaks in the you know breaks through the door, all that, and he is. He, because he had an experience that he simply cannot explain he is scared because in this case with very limited amount of information which is almost none being in that state of confusion it's fearful because you're not the one in control in this case he was losing it he he had all of a sudden this very creative instinct to create devil's tower which at the time he didn't know what that was and this is something that happens in a lot of very meticulous artists where they have a vision in their mind and they're doing whatever they can to replicate it to recreate it there are people that 
classify themselves or allegedly are experiencers or get downloads, meaning when an entity comes and puts information in their brain, they in some way, not all the time, but in many aspects, attempt to place on paper or in this case, sculpt out what they're envisioning in their mind. But because he was so fearful, he told his wife, please just hold me. I'm scared. I don't know what's going on. And in this moment of vulnerability, what does the wife do? She just yells at him saying that she hates him and that pretty much he needs to figure it out on his own because he's an absolute whack job. In these moments of vulnerability, Every single one of us, we've gone through something along those lines where we just want to be held in some way. And when that isn't fulfilled, it can cause more issues than benefits. Now for him, luckily, he was able to get those answers near the end of the film. But for people that have similar experiences, like in the movie Close Encounter of the Third Kind, when you become alienated, uh, when when you have these types of experiences and no one can relate to you and you can't express them. So you practically just get clipped out of society and that's where the fear lies. So a lot of people, they don't, they don't tell their stories because of this particular fear that Roy went through in the film. Yeah, and, and, and Spielberg captures that emotion throughout the movie. Okay, he, he really does. It, 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 it's not... All of those scenes with, with Terry Garr and the family at home and the mashed potatoes and him building the mud thing in the living room and the ducks and him getting the chicken wire and throwing stuff through the window and the neighbors watching. He jumps on the car, remember, and and, and she's driving away and he's trying to, there, there he is throwing plants through the window, pulling up the plants, Roy! Roy, what are you doing? And 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 so, but but he's capturing those moments and that scene with um with Roy in the bathtub with his clothes on and Terry Gar is yelling and she kicks down the door. Yes, a very intense scene. But that that Spielberg takes it one step further. He brings the kids into the scene and the kids are watching mom and dad. Dad's in the bathtub, you know, with his clothes on and crying. She's yelling at him and they turn around. The kids are crying. The kids and they yell at the kids to get out of there. That's a very intense, very intense. I don't know how you capture that. And, and how you, you get your actors to go through that and how you get the kids to go through this. But it's capturing the moment, and you're exactly right. It seems like that. Why people that have encounters and contact and, and see things about the UFO subject do not talk about it because that's the drama that you go through. And, and Spielberg captured it. And that isolation, by the way, it continues throughout the movie, the journey, the thing, the trip across the country. Um, uh, uh, Melinda Dillon. Okay. Now, there uh, for me, Melinda Dillon, uh, who uh, uh, plays uh, Julian uh, 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 Geeler in the movie, uh, her son is Barry, and uh, played by uh, uh, Gary Guffey, uh, Carrie Guffey. And, and Carrie, at the time, he was cast for the film. Are you ready? Mm. Three years old. Three, right? Okay. And and that those scenes um, with Barry in the movie, as a parent, are some of the most emotional things that you can go through as a parent. And uh, I watch the film. I watch the film at least once a month. Everybody knows that. I go back and I watch it. I watched it again last night in, in prep for this, but I watched it last week. I watch the film all the time. And the scene when Barry gets abducted, right? And, and uh, Melinda Dillon is running around the cornfields of Muncie, Indiana, um, outside of her house or soybean field, but a farmland with the, and she's yelling, Barry, Barry, that scene, her son, her three-year-old just got abducted and has disappeared and is, is, is torn from her life. And the way that Spielberg captures that on, on, uh, on an emotional viewpoint for a parent 
for me, it's nearly an unwatchable scene. I can't, I can't imagine uh, going through that, but Spielberg did it. And he does it consistently throughout the film. Extremely deep character uh, development based around E.T. and contact and what is going on. We haven't talked about India and the, the oh, scenes that were filmed there. We're going to get there, but I want to okay, go in well, chronological well, order th here. Th that's why I want to back up. Okay, so let's back up. The but before you back up, before you back up, <laughs> Jimmy, Marty, thank you so much. He says, I've always had an idea for a sequel where uh, Neri comes back years later, still the same age, but tries to reconnect with his kids and his wife. And I always thought it was weird that he didn't have a buddy. I thought about that, too. It is kind I of I thought odd. Melinda Dillon was going to go with him. I thought Me the too. two of them at, at the end of the movie, they were going to go. But Barry steps off. They return Barry. Right. So she gets re reunited with Barry and and Dreyfus uh, goes on his own. You're that's such a great point. Um, I think that everybody saw the journey that these two were taking together and you didn't expect that at the end. I think what we all, you know, Barry re being returned, I think we all expected Melinda and and Dreyfus, right, <laughs> to walk hand in hand and walk up. But let's back up. Let's back up. Back and up. Daniel, back up. Thank you so much as well. The yeah. opening scene of the movie, Flight Nineteen, yes. uh, the Bermuda uh, the Bermuda Triangle case, and the d disappearance of Flight Nineteen. Um, that's when we get introduced to uh, two main characters in the movie. Um, which is Francis Truffaut, you know, playing Jacques Vallée, of course, and uh, Truffaut, and um, uh, 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 Bob Babylon, and Bob Babylon, who, if you know, he's he's great in 2010. He's great in all of the Christopher Guest movies and everything. Bob Babylon's one of my Ghost World, right? Plays the dad in Ghost World. He's one of my favorite actors. He's great. This is one of his first films. <clears throat> And, and he plays a cartographer, right? And But he's also the translator because he speaks French and he also speaks Spanish. And that opening scene of the famous, you know, Flight 19 disappearance, it gets returned now. And the reason why I think for myself, there's Bob Babylon uh, right there. I love Bob. He's He's just an amazing actor. The reason why that opening scene was so perfect and so well planned for Spielberg is that most of us, even outside of our community, we've heard of the Bermuda Triangle. We've heard of the disappearance of Flight 19 that took off out of Fort Lauderdale on a training mission and and none of the planes returned. The search planes that went out didn't return. Those crashed too as well. And so it was a very famous case. And and to have Spielberg present it there where the, fl the planes are returned in Mexico uh, uh, set the stage because everybody could relate to the film and this historical incident is now tied into this movie. And I think it was a really... Uh, a, a great idea by Steven Spielberg to to start the film that way. It was adding multiple layers of mystery, but on top of that, these actors that at the moment when the film started, we weren't familiar with them. We didn't know their names. We didn't know their standpoints in this. And then you have the topographer, this guy right here with the nice little beard and the cool glasses. He's like, what's going on here? I don't understand. How is this even possible? This flight 19 is from 19 from the 1940s. How is it here? How does it look pristine? How does it look brand new? They look brand new. Yeah, and the thing yeah, is that yeah, with yeah, these yeah, types yeah, of mysteries, yeah. have it be the ufo phenomenon have it be strangest appearances we don't have the answers but all we can do at the very best is experience them and i think again here spielberg conveyed that beautifully and it's something that is entwined in the entire film this level of mystery but also this level of in a sense a type of excitement, wanting to know the answers. And this is something that so many of us feel, so many of us, where we become so hungry and our thirst becomes unquenchable when looking for these mysteries and trying to find the answers. But the thing is that unless you go on your own little mothership, 
you're probably not going to find all the answers that you're looking for. In this case, for Roy, he had this childlike curiosity. Throughout the film, he he showed childlike characteristics, like when he was brushing his teeth and the boys came took a picture of him and he was like acting like a monster, playing with trains, um, having a, a face that looked, that was filled with wonderment when he was when a beam of light came on him and he got radiation burns, a sunburn. Oh, okay. Well, we'll, 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 we'll pump the brakes, pump the brakes, pump the brakes. Oh, it's a also, Jacques Vallée. That's a, wait, 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 wait. If you're wait, liking wait. the show, hit the like button. Do that hit right the like now. Button. Great. Hit, hit the like button. Okay. No, that's a Jacques Vallée thing. So let's back up. That That's a very important point. So let's back up. The opening scene with flight 19 uh, Francis Truffaut, right, the Jacques Vallée character, he goes up to the old man sitting on the front porch of the of the cantina, and he is uh, speaking in Spanish about what he had witnessed. Truffaut looks at his face, and he's sunburned, radiation burns, and remember who the character is portraying, right? Jacques Vallée. And this is something that Jacques Vallée has written about, talked about time after time after time. It's the physical trauma that comes with these close encounter experiences that needs to be analyzed. That's what kind of attention to detail that Spielberg put in this film. So we see it there at the beginning. Yes, it's, a, it's an official nod to Jacques Vallée for sure. Most of the audience isn't going to understand that as Jacques Vallée as they're looking at the old man's face. But then you fast forward to the scene with Richard Dreyfus when he looks out the window, gets his face sunburned, and then goes home. Again, that's Jacques Vallée. Very important. It's those little those little nuggets that that are spread out through the film. For those of us in ufology, we totally get it. But it's educating the world in, in a very cool way. And and I think Spielberg for that. Yes. And there when you look at this, these radiation type burns, there have been multiple encounters that people have had that have been documented that are very similar, like the Cash Landrum incident or the Stanford alien abduction, where people they have these types of radiation burns or radiation type symptoms on the body after encountering some type of craft and i think here uh, in this in this particular scene where his his car stops working none of the lights are working all the lights in the town are out he feels this vibration there's you know his car is vibrating he looks out the window and half of his face is sunburned. Um, that was something that you don't really notice it until a few minutes later when it's better lighting and you're able to see that his face is literally two different colors. He ends up later on meeting up with Jillian after he almost ran over Barry. And that uh, little boy was right. adorable. Okay. Like, yeah, he was. He was. You, you know what it, he does today, by the way? No. He's a math professor at a community college in Ohio. We need math teachers. I don't think he ever acted after that. He I don't didn't. think he, no. I don't think you did either. Um, so did. When, when I looked at the casting pictures, it was only Barry's face when he was, what, four years old or something like that. Right, Super right, cute. right. But even the mother, Barry's mother, also had radiation burns, but kind of like below her brow line. So her face and her chest area. But this is something that has been researched and documented for a handful of decades where people, again, that have these types of very close encounters counters get some type of burn radiation burn of, of some kind so this was really cool to see and there were a lot of cases that were going through my mind when when seeing this and daniel a member for 12 months that is so awesome thank you for always supporting the channel and being a big fan of the show he says jimmy can you read this one for me it says, I thought uh uh Shyamalan, Shyamalan uh, ding dong um he's a good screenwriter um, M. Night. Uh, science was both believable and cautionary in how people would react in that situation. Yeah, you know what? Uh, in M. Night's Signs, uh, which is also a great film, by the way, but the scene when uh, uh, the dad, the sheriff, he comes home and and the kids are all sitting on the couch with their tinfoil hats, 
watching TV. And I just thought to myself, that's exactly how it is. But yeah, you can't, you, you, you just can't deal with the public. Um, it's impossible. Um, somebody may a, a asked in the, it's uh, too, too many chats are, are going by, so I'm not going to scroll back to it, but somebody asked, um, if he had advice, oh, here it is right here. Um, did Spielberg have UFO advisors for this movie? Well, we just mentioned Jacques Vallée, but the title of the movie itself uh, it comes from J. Allen Hynek. And J. Allen Hynek had uh, four or five, I think he upped it to six different classifications of UFO contact. What are you doing? What was that? I was looking for this particular picture and I couldn't see it. So, but then she, I found it. Did, did, did everybody, I, I, somebody needs to make that a meme. Just go back to that part of the show, snip it, send it to me. And uh, I we we've got to make that a meme. That was great. That was great. I thought you were looking for like ramen on your chin or something, and somebody made a comment. That's J. Allen Hynek right there. And Hynek uh, does a walk on in the film with this pipe. It's a very famous scene. This is at the end when uh, E.T. comes down. We're not giving anything away in this movie. The movie is 1977. So it's, you know, it's almost 40 years ago. I can't believe that. 46 wow. years. Yeah. Uh, 46 years. Uh, uh, almost 50 years ago. Um, I can't. It, it, that blows my mind. But. If you haven't seen it, that's 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 on you. Pretty much everybody on planet Earth has seen this film and has access to uh, a television. Anyway, that's J. Allen Hynek. So, yes, he was a consultant on the film. Um, there were many consultants on the film. And the other part about this is that Spielberg, uh, ever since he was a kid, and it, you can go watch... Uh, the Fablemans, I think, is a great movie, uh, the, the biography of Spielberg that he just made. But he's always been fascinated with science fiction, and he's always shot science fiction-themed things ever since he was a little kid and he got his first camera. In 1973, he approached um, uh, Columbia Pictures. He had a deal with Columbia Pictures, and he says, hey, I want to make a science fiction film. All right. So uh, he developed uh, the idea for the movie. And in the film, this is what is interesting. So we were just talking about uh, consultants, right, uh, about the subject. Spielberg is given credit for writing the script, but he didn't he didn't write it by himself. All right. He was assisted by Paul Schrader, John Hill, David Geiler, Hal Barward, Matthew Robbins, and Jerry Belson all contributed to the screenplay in varying degrees. Um, but so there's that part. It wasn't Stephen writing this by himself. And of course, we have Jacques Vallée and J. Allen Hynek. The title of the movie comes from this man right here. Um, uh, J. Allen Hynek's classification of close encounters, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, a type one, type two, type three. One is uh, a sighting, right? And, and, and type two is, and, you know, type three, you make contact. Close encounters of the third kind, you make contact with an alien entity. And, and Heineck was the one that named the movie. Everyone else was against it other than Spielberg. And so he had a hard time not with delivering the movie, but delivering the title of the movie because people were like, what does this even mean, Close Encounters of the Third Kind? I don't get it because they weren't a part of the UFO community during that time frame and knowledgeable with Project Blue Book. But it was J. Allen Heineck who not only gave the title of the film, but to my understanding... Um, he had written a book about UFOs, one kind of when he stopped becoming so much of a skeptic, a little bit more of a believer from with the scientific aspect to it. Spielberg read the book, he loved it. And a lot of the a lot of the book that Heineck wrote, Spielberg put in his movie so much so that Heineck was like, whoa, 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 whoa. If you're gonna be using my book to that extent, at least add me on to the list of creators or in this case a technical advisor and on top of that i'd very much like to do a cameo but also 
smoking my pipe, which is what I do best. And he, I mean, that's what he's known for. Heineck is known for his yeah, amazing, is. authentic, old timey pipe, which is 10 <laughs> out of 10 right there. But the thing is, Heineck really, really influenced this film with the overall vision and the title, but he's not given as much credit as you would expect. But aside from that, People that are familiar with Project Blue Book were like, oh, my gosh, that's Jay Allen Hynek fangirling kind of deal. Did you say old timey? Did, Did I say it say, incorrectly? No, you, you said it very correctly in an old timey sort of way. Here's the crowd. OK, so here's the crazy. No, I, I it, it, it was an old timey pipe. Was an old timey pipe. Can you even buy those anymore? You can. Yes, you can. You can buy old timey pipes. Okay. Yes. So anyway, antiques. Um, it was made for a budget of just nineteen million dollars. Now that was nineteen seventy seven dollars, but uh, <laughs> it, 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 it converted to uh, twenty twenty money. It was still uh, a pretty inexpensive film to make. You had Douglas Trumbull and the special effects stuff. But a lot of it, remember, uh, this is uh, this was just actors acting on set. So there wasn't, you know, this extreme uh, investment into this. No, it was done with a relatively low budget. And the other part about this, um, it was first released uh, to a limited number of cities in November of 1977, expanded into wide release the following month um, at, with a $19 million investment. And, and that, I'm talking about $1977. It grossed $300 million in 1977. dollars. That's billions of dollars today. In today's money. That's how much of a success that this film was. Um, it received uh, all kinds of awards. It received nominations, uh, Academy Awards, uh, the British Academy Awards, uh, the 35th Golden Globe Awards, and the 5th Saturn Awards. Um, and uh, it's widely acclaimed by the American Film Institute. But I, I think for me, and uh, we'll move on, but in December of 2007, it was deemed culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant by the United States Library of Congress and selected for preservation in the National Film Registry. Uh, that, that doesn't happen often, but it is uh, exactly why this film is so great. It is, it's a perfect film. It's perfect. It's Even perfect. Jimmy Carter commented on it, sent Spielberg a letter saying that he thoroughly enjoyed the film. But I have an interesting quote that I want to share. Here it is. According to Press and Dial UFO.com, NASA even wrote to Spielberg warning him not to release the movie because it was too dangerous. And here's what it says. I really found my faith when I heard that the government was opposed to the film, Close Encounters. If NASA took the time to write me a 20-page letter, then I knew there must be something happening. I had just wanted cooperation with them, but when they read the script, they got very angry and felt that it was a film that would be dangerous. And I felt this, I felt they mainly wrote the letter because Jaws convinced so many people around the world that there were sharks and toilets and bathtubs and not just the oceans and rivers. They were afraid of the same problem that would happen with UFOs. This. I, I find it pretty incredible, uh, if you ask me, for NASA, if this quote is true, for NASA to allegedly write a 20-page letter to Spielberg saying, this is a no-go, you really shouldn't do this. And yet Spielberg was like, you know what, thank you for that, now I'm really going to do it. Just like a child, don't touch that, what are they going to do? They're going to touch it. Now... One of the, now, it, it, here's the thing, when people say, yeah, you know, it just stood the test of time, it's a great film, and it is, it, 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 well, it, it was, it was a big deal then, and it's, it's still a big deal today, but we're talking about 46 years later today, and, and, and how should we view the film? Let me explain something. J. Allen Hynek, what, back then, was an angry young man. Okay, 
Project Blue Book. He's writing. He's writing his own books. He's upset with the government. He's upset with the Air Force. He's upset with the cover up. He was upset that he was a tool. Uh, he was not a happy guy. Oh, look at Jacques Vallee. Look at that hair. The sideburns look, really look bring at, in the seventies. I dig it. Well, look at Jacques Vallee. I just talked to him. Man, I love that guy. Anyway, so um, uh, the. The the view today, considering 46 years ago and how things have and have not changed and how things repeat and stay the same, J. Allen Hynek was angry. And one of the things that he was angry for a lot of reasons, but one of the main was a cover up. He felt that there was a cover up going on and that science wasn't being applied to this and that the phenomenon was real and 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 so forth. Well, uh, the examples of cover ups that the community knows about. OK, we can go back to Roswell and forward and there's one after another. Every case in Project Blue Book is a cover up is misinformation and disinformation. And it's presented wonderfully in Close Encounters. How do they do it? Oh, they do okay. it with a chemical spill. And uh, and they evacuate the county and all of the surrounding areas. And the cover-up starts. The news is covering it. It's on, if, if you, uh, it, it's set up from the beginning of the film and then to the end. In the beginning of the film, Richard Dreyfus is doing his ginormous thing in the dining room, right? Terry Garr has left the house. And on the TV screen, there's uh, Devil's Tower. I keep this up. On the TV screen is a news report, right? And it's it's, uh, it's it's news live. And it's showing Devil's Tower in the background. And they're talking about the chemical spill and the evacuation orders of that area. And, and Richard Dreyfus doesn't see it because he's on the phone. And he's on the other side of the room. TV's pointed in the opposite direction. He doesn't know what he's making in his living room. And the way that Spielberg shoots the scene, right, with the TV in the foreground and, and Dreyfus's sculpture in the background, they match. And it's such a brilliant scene. Dreyfus comes back to the TV and misses it. Right? <laughs> he, he comes back around. So anyway, let's, let's talk about this cover-up. The the piggly wiggly trucks, right? The Baskin the, Robbins. The Baskin Robbins was an awesome move, right? And it makes you wonder, you know, what what's running around in tractor trailers sometimes? Uh, could it be something else? It was an awesome way to present this, as Steven Spielberg did, and that's the cover up. They had to evacuate the town, and if you remember, Jillian was missing. Right, Jillian's having the same visions. Jillian's making those paintings. Jillian took the paintings out after Barry disappears. What does she do? She burns them. She's trying to, you know, her son has been uh, uh, abducted, and but she's got these visions, and she goes on her own journey to Devil's Tower. Meanwhile, Richard Dreyfus is doing the same thing. They pull into town that is being evacuated. How are they being evacuated? on trains and i thought wow spielberg i mean symbolism and everything else but evacuating the town on trains uh, with all of the confusion there and that's the cover-up right so you have what's going on right now in peru right now we've got an alien invasion going on down there i had timothy alberino on the show last night and one of the things that he talked about, again, very similar to Spielberg and other situations, we talked about this last night, is that right now there are military exercises going on with Southcom and Ecuador and Peru and Chile and Panama. And I guess Great Britain is even involved in this, which is weird because it's supposed to be South America, Southcom, Southern Command. But where are they? They're in Peru, in the jungles the militaries around the world right now 
are having military exercises in the jungle while there's an alien invasion going on. Coincidence? Cover up? Cover story? Is there something else happening? Well, Spielberg told us all about it back in 1977. And what was- a visionary. It was portrayed amazing. Also, the planning on how they were going to evacuate so many people. There was a poison in the air killing cattle, and that would also kill people as well. So they tried to push everyone out. I believe it was a 300-mile radius uh, from Devil's Tower along those lines. And it worked for a lot of people, minus a handful that felt very compelled to go to Devil's Tower. Obi-Wan, thank you so much for supporting the channel. He says, can I talk about the score? So very good. This is a prime example of why... Why John Williams is a master. 100% and- correct. 100% correct on that. Yes, that's 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 all I've got to say. John Williams. Uh, there's a great. There's a there's a lot of great uh, film scores out there. Maricone and and, uh, uh, and we we can go on and on. But uh, I have to say that John Williams is the best of the best. So and- there you go. And Cassidy, thank you so much as well. I do appreciate that. Did she do that again? I saw that pop up earlier. But How yeah, many... but I didn't. I didn't address it. So I'm addressing it now, and I'm saying thank uh, you. Oh, I thought Cassidy was just like RV fun day. You in, know, which, coming thank in you. strong. It, it does go to the RV fund. But in this particular image, you have the military searching for the people that want to go visit Devil's Tower that feel compelled to do so. But there were only three people that ended up getting off of the helicopter after they were all collected and rallied up. And then one of them ended up not making it. And it was just Jillian and Roy that made it up to the tippy top of the, of the, um, do you hear, do do you have like a black helicopter over your place? Did you guys hear that? I was like the third time. Okay. All right. Moving on this devil's tower. This is the cover up black helicopters. Are above the house. That's uh, you, you didn't hear that, Christina. No, I have my headphones in, so I can't hear much except you. But it, where's it coming from? Well, I don't know because I have my headphones in, so I can't well, hear much. So is it coming from here? I thought it came from there. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, so but uh, okay, so here's the part about this scene and the the one uh, uh, right before this. So you've got uh, things are dying. Uh, you have goats and, and and cattle are lying on the side of the road um, and, and things. You have a guy selling birds, right? Canaries in, in right? Canaries and masks for forty five dollars <laughs> back in nineteen seventy seven. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's selling gorgeous. all of these things, right? So um, uh, Dreyfus buys a bird, right? He's got the bird in the front seat of the car. He he gets his face mask and he and he takes off. And, um, uh, but when a couple of things happen, one, when they get stopped at the roadblock, his bird is knocked out. I thought that was a pretty interesting thing, but Dreyfus wasn't. Well, when, back it up, back it up, Jimmy. See, what happened was they were watching the birds while they were in the car, but as soon as they had to exit the car and the people in these, like, hazard suits grabbed the birds, that's when it passed out. So that's what they... I'm saying. Yes, yes, that's what, yeah, 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 yeah. So that whole time, right, that the, there doesn't seem to be any issues. And, and then as they get closer and closer to Devil's Tower, they start to see the dead animals in the farmland. Was that is that part of the cover up, right? Is that the government going in and 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 killing these animals for people to see and going, oh man, wow, this is actually a real thing. So yes, yes, uh, that's uh, that's that's part of the cover up. But then when they go and they're all on the helicopter and they're going to be evacuated, what is what does Dreyfus do? He takes off his mask. And remember the old lady sitting next to him with the face mask yeah, on? She was like, What are you doing? Right. And and they bail. They bail. They take off running. And uh the other guy uh, uh goes with him. I, I I that was like his few scenes in the movie, but he was like, I'm going with you. So it was the three of them. 
and and they make their escape off of the base. Um, it was really funny how uh, the general, the guy that was operating everything, he goes back to the jeep. As soon as the helicopter takes off, what does he do? He takes his face mask off and throws it in the jeep. And uh, that this is all a setup. It, it it's not real. But as long as you say this and you suggest it, those people on the uh, uh, the helicopter, they weren't taking off their mask. No way. They watched Dreyfus do it. He's fine. But they kept their mask on. So the cover-up. And it was so well done by Spielberg and so well played, including what continues after the gassing of, of uh, uh, Devil's Tower, trying to gas Jillian and Roy, uh, who are, you know, and the th- and, and guy number three. And guy number three gets gassed, remember? He, I do. He gets gassed, yeah. I do. I think that's but... his name in the script. Guy number three. No, he, yeah, he guy, mentions guy his three. name once, but it was so fast and out of breath, I wasn't able to catch his name. So I'm, I'm going to admit it. Uh, obviously, I'm not a true fan here because I, I didn't write down his his name. But, and I am, but I am a fan, by the way. <laughs> but uh, what I did want to say was that in the last 46 years since this movie came out, overall, what have we learned? What has been confirmed? And that did... Did this all happen in the 40s after Roswell, this whole type of setup and cover up and things like that? I do want to share this next image uh, because I think it's important because a few years ago, I mean, this is like relatively recent. Lou Elizondo gave an interview for GQ magazine and they asked him about his thoughts of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And this is what he says. I would have to say Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I just recently saw it for the first time and I was really shocked at some of the performance characteristics and how they depicted the UAPs because it is exactly how uh, they've been described in some up until recently very classified U.S. documents. The description of how they do right angle turns at very fast velocity, the illumination, the shapes of some of these craft, it's unbelievable. And this is someone that has, that was a director of ATIP that was funded by the Pentagon. He has come forward saying, I don't like this cover up. He did a lot of interviews, both on podcasts and across just like the mainstream media as well. Also going to a few conferences and just talking about without infringing on any NDAs saying, this there there's a mystery out there this is something that needs to be discussed the government needs to be transparent and we need to fight for the answers that we want but i found it peculiar and also very interesting that out of the thousands and thousands and thousands of questions that he's been asked when it came to this particular movie he had so i mean it seems to me something pretty positive to say about it saying it's it's almost a little too accurate and i think now 46 years later we can really connect the dots and see a lot of other cases that are very similar to this movie people are going to ask did this actually happen is is this movie true was this a, a real case in my and there's rumors some saying yes some saying no but from seeing it from my point of view i felt like it was a handful of different cases coming together and one thing that lou elizondo mentioned right here in this little quote that i'd like to really touch on were the different shaped craft that were seen during this time frame when you saw an alien movie it was one shaped craft and it could be any shape round you know like, kind of like star wars right which came out the very same year as close encounters by the way 1977 but overall you got one craft shape and that was it in this movie we saw everything from saucers to diamond shapes to an ice cream cone that barry said but in all of them whenever a ufo was seen there was a red orb coming from the back trailing at the end and that was something that i was like that's a really really cool detail that people that have these encounters and write them down see things very similar there were also scenes where one craft turned into multiple crafts like the aguadilla 
case uh, video in Puerto Rico that has been confirmed by the Pentagon that it is authentic, which is also something really interesting. So 46 years later, we are able, at least from in a better capacity, be able to look at these certain scenes and say, well, this scene reminds me of this and this case is very famous or it's been confirmed as authentic by the Pentagon or the government and things like that. So in in your perspective, Jimmy, do you think this movie set some kind of foundation? Was it was it just merely entertainment? Was it some form of disclosure? And what do you think people can learn about this film? Yes, and uh, all great points. And and to answer that, one of the things that Spielberg showed the world um, uh, when you saw uh, the the crafts, you had the mothership. You had the baby mothership. You had the thing, the, the small, everything different, everything lit up different. Everything had a different shape, different size, different thing, all the way down, you know, down, 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 down. And it seemed to the way that he did it, he gave these craft personalities. They acted differently, right? So you had the big intimidating, the thing, you know, a quiet, right, and huge, and and it, 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 and you could see that that was the leader, that was the commander, that was the intelligence, that was a, but then all the way down to the little red orbs and the blue orbs, they were childlike. They were like chasing the craft. They were like the little assistants. Pew, 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 pew. Right? It, he gave them personality. He, he, you identified with what was going on with these. And um, I, I thought that that was a brilliant way. And, and so when you see the film and you see the metaphors and you see the, the, the character development um, and, and, and everything else that is presented in the film, things start to take on this very deep uh, character development that was not only with the humans, but with the ETs and the craft themselves. And I think that the little red orbs and the, and here we've got the, the blue ones. Remember they came kind of leading in, in, in the parade. Remember? Right. right. They, they've got a personality. They've got this thing about them. You know that these aren't the leaders. These aren't the troublemakers. These aren't the the, the ones we're going to communicate with. These aren't good. These aren't bad. These are they're they're kind of childlike, innocent, you know, balls of light that are leading this in. And I, th I thought that was, so when you watch the film now, look at it with those eyes and start to think about how Spielberg gave each one of these a little bit of a, a different personality, personality type and a job and a function, right? It was very well done. Uh, just a brilliant part of the movie for me. Now the other, okay, so here's the other thing. There are, uh, to answer your question, um, to me, the, the the red orbs were very significant. They were childlike, and I, I like that presentation. But the other part is this. Many, including myself, believe that this is based on uh, real events and an actual event. But which one? Because we have Eisenhower in the treaty. Right. We have that. That's one idea. We have Project Serpo. Right. That's another one. Um, we have Betty and Barney Hill and the abductions and and what they went through. Uh, we have uh, back then, by the way. OK, this is 1977. Spielberg never heard of Roswell. OK. All right. That 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 that, and, that and, came and that came Jimmy, out later. Jimmy, please explain that. People are going to be like, "What do you mean Spielberg didn't hear of Roswell?" Just very briefly well, nobody, explain why that's the yeah, case. That's the cover up. Okay, so um, uh, it wasn't until Jesse uh, Marcel uh, got together with his buddies at a reunion 
and they started talking about uh, Roswell in the incident in 1947. Um, but between 1947 and 1980, nobody, it, Roswell was erased from the public record. So you had the Roswell newspaper, the Roswell Daily Record, that uh, published that famous headline, right? R-A-A-F, uh, 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 Recovers Flying Saucer. Um, uh, and, and so forth. So we have that. And that was in July 8th of 1947. The next day, the, the paper said, ah, nothing to see here. And that was the end of Roswell. So between that point and all the way up until 1980, there was, it wasn't in any books. There wasn't uh, J. Allen Hein wasn't in Project Blue Book. J. Allen Hynek never commented about Roswell. It was uh, Jacques Vallée, right? Anybody that you can think of as a researcher, right? Um, but it took uh, Stanton Friedman and uh, uh, a few others at the time, uh, uh, Berliner and uh, uh, and others. I just w won't get into the details that started to uncover and unravel Roswell. But that's a modern part of history. When Spielberg made this film in 1977, Roswell and its cover up was not a consideration because he didn't know about it. Thank you for taking the time to explain that, because I know people were going to say, what do you mean they didn't know about Roswell? It's very famous now, but that wasn't the case a few decades prior. Getting near kind of the end of the film, and I don't feel like we went chronologically here, but that's okay, because we're just so excited to share everything that, that we can about this film. But near the end, we are seeing the military and the big brains really attempting to communicate with this mothership craft and all of the other smaller craft using music, which has a mathematical formula behind it. People always say that math is the universal language, but could that also mean that music is? Well, many would say yes. Music should be a consistent theme across the galaxy with intelligent life. At least we would assume so because it requires a little bit of intellect in order to create music. Okay. But with this they're communicating back and forth. One person saying, what are we even talking about here? I don't even know what this conversation is. It was really all about mimicry, to my understanding, which in that shows a level of intelligence when you're able to mimic or repeat what the other person or the other entity is saying. The craft comes down, it lands, and then people from Flight 19, from, from that ship, that, that airplane, that was found in the desert in Mexico at the very beginning of the film comes all the way back and the pilots come out. They didn't age. They're in an absolute daze and they address themselves to say who they are and that they are from Flight 19, which was amazing. And then we saw some other characters come out. We see Barry come out, which was super exciting. But then we begin to, well, we, we see the cameo of J. Allen Hynek, but then we start to see the aliens. And this is where it gets kind of weird. There's some other amazing images here. But then we see this really creepy looking alien that I would truly classify as Slenderman here before Slenderman was even a thing. Other people, when I was trying to do research on this particular scene, people were saying that it's meant to portray a praying mantis-like alien. Um, did I see that? No. <laughs> I, I, did, I just saw something like really scary with really long legs and arms and a creepy looking body. But this wasn't the only alien species that we saw. Here's him standing up, this slender man without the suit. But then we see all the little baby aliens or the greys. But the question, here, here, were, here were my thoughts, Jimmy, on this. First, we see the humans come out. Then we see this giant alien kind of scoping out the area, saying, okay, I think it might be safe for my little gray companions to come out. But to me, because these had more human-like eyes than the typical gray aliens, I was thinking, is this some type of hybridization program that they are conducting on the ship that that's where my mind went at first is that the case that has never been answered to my understanding but when you saw this particular scene jimmy what was going through your mind seeing not just one but three different 
looking aliens. Yeah, the, I, I um, at the time, uh, because I've seen the film so many times, so we have to go like decade by decade by decade on how uh, I perceive uh, this scene and how I am affected by it. Um, but here's, here's one thing that is the same today as it was back then. The little grays, when they come out, they don't act smart, right? They don't like, and they don't act like advanced beings. What do they do? I am a robot, right? They just kind of walk around. They just kind of do their thing. And that was, I mean, so well done. But Spielberg obviously wanted to portray uh, the the worker bees, right? The the grays uh, uh, one way, and then the intelligent light being, right? That comes out, right, and raises his hand, Christ like on a cross. You know, sacrificing yeah. himself for humanity. Uh, uh, all of that. There's heavy symbolism in that scene. Um, so yes. Now the, the what Spielberg Spielberg got a lot right then. And if we look at it today, right, 46 years later, and look back, it's amazing how much he got right. Um, now uh, it goes. We have to mention. In the film Artificial Intelligence, AI, which is also a Spielberg film, at the end of that movie, in the far, far, far future, right? Earth is now in the middle of an ice age. New York is frozen underwater, what looks like New York. It's frozen underwater. Um, Humanity's over with, right? Everything is done. The only thing that has survived is a robot, the kid, right? Okay, the AI, the kid. And so, but who shows up? E.T. And E.T. comes down and they, they, they're, they're cutting through the ice and they're exploring Earth, which is uninhabited now, right? Okay. Um, but they, they go down and they rescue the kid uh, who's an AI and they kind of come up. And how does Spielberg portray E.T.? It's the very same depiction, not exactly, but the shape, right? Tall, thin, slender, long arms, long eggs, uh, legs. And in, uh, in, in AI, they're energy beings. They have that shape. Go back to the spindly dude. They have that shape. Yeah, right there. They have that shape, but they're energy beings. And if we, I think Spielberg would have done it the same way in Close Encounters had he had the technology. He did the, he did it the best way that he could back then. But there is something here where he was told, I don't think this is his imagination. That this is my take. I would love to speak with Spielberg about this. He's addressed it, but I think he hasn't been asked the right questions. Um, there, uh, he has said publicly, look, people say that, you know, that, uh, I have inside information and, and, and uh, that there's a, no, this was just a, a, a good story. That's all that is being presented in close encounters. I'm like, no, no, uh, you know, he's towing the line there. He's not being asked the right questions. So he has to answer it that way. I, I would ask him. Where did you get your information on how to portray E.T.? Who, who guided you through this? Because you have different types of species here, and you have leaders, and you have workers. Where did this information come from? Because in 1977, we didn't have, we didn't know what we know today. You know, we had Betty and Barney Hill, yes. We had Travis Walton, yes. We had science fiction, B movies from the 1950s. Yes, we had a, a few things here and there. Yes, right? Yeah, we, we did. But in 1977, we didn't have uh the the knowledge base that we have today, Christina. And and Spielberg got it right, and he got it right 46 years ago. 
You know, it's 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 amazing to me. It's amazing. So yeah, where where did he get his? Is it based on reality? Is this based on 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 that? I I, I really want to know. Well, since that time frame, people have come forward and have allegedly mentioned their encounters with mantis-like beings, with gray-like entities that seem to be robotic. Um, and then, but what was interesting about this particular ET, this was the only one that actually communicated with the people and demonstrating the, hand, the same hand uh, gestures to the music as in, um, as was conveyed by the people. Um, in that, I found that really weird. So you had the little grays coming in and, and they took Roy as, as I want to say as a sacrifice here. We don't really know what they're doing. There was a director's clip, uh, a, which is funny. Um, a director's clip of when he actually yeah, goes inside and show. we're able, and we're able to see I can't the do inside show of the show. <laughs> I haven't laughed that hard in a long time. Why did I, I say did. that was wrong? Nothing. It's Voice what you typed. <laughs> <laughs> well, for oh those for those God. that are for those that are watching this live, oh, hit the like button. We have oh, 365 likes, 476 people watching. What, what's this the live. goal today? Are we doing a thousand? It's it's a million. You know what? Why yeah, not? Go make or go home. <laughs> It's a so, just just go ahead and, and please like it if you do are you have um, the in the time that we have left um do you have oh 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 so is it is it project serpo but project serpo again that that story didn't come out till much later so uh, are we dealing with like the 11th green and eisenhower and the treaties or was uh, Spielberg in consultation with others uh, on the inside that had information uh, about this? So I, I, the, the things that we know about today, that, 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 that's a modern thing. Serpo was a modern thing. That's year 2000, <laughs> 23 years after this film was made. So no, it was it wasn't based on any of that, and we have a hard time um, uh, trying to make those kinds of connections because we think that oh, Project Serpo was was you know I, I, so Roswell. Everybody knows about Roswell. Everybody knows about that. Everybody knows about Cash Lander. No, 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 that is simply not the case. So, um, uh, but in the limited time that we have left. Do you have I have, I have two questions for you Christina. What's your favorite scene? Oh, oh, I have so many. I have so many, but one of them that I actually wanted to address and haven't had time and I'm really glad Hyde's kind of brought it up was about the little the little I want to say cameo of Lockheed Martin. Okay, being one of the companies shown in the movie as being involved in the transportation of equipment to the contact site. So what did you think about the choice of using Lockheed Martin being one of the companies shown in the movie as being involved in the transportation of the equipment? Do I mean, do you, was... me to, do you really want me to answer that? I mean, do I, I have to? I, you don't I mean, have it's to obvious, answer it, it's, like obvious, to answer. It's, it's obvious he is in consultation with the right people. And this was before Area 51 was disclosed. This is before anybody knew what Skunk Works was. The SR-71 was still a secret plane in the U-2 and the development and this and that and all of that. And to have Lockheed Martin on the shipping crates, right? <laughs> to have Lockheed Martin clearly presented there was because Spielberg knew exactly what he was trying to say. And, and that's it. I, now, is uh, am I going full conspiracy right now? No, I think it's obvious. I don't think it's a conspiracy at all. We know about Lockheed. We know what they have been doing. Uh, I don't think it's it's like it's it's truly the elephant in the room, right? We it, it it's right there. We all know what's going on. That's how correct Spielberg got it forty six years ago. So okay, so but what's your favorite scene? Okay, my other favorite scene, and I have a screenshot for this, and something that happened at the very beginning, and we didn't have time to cover it, but thank you for asking me because I do really, really want to cover this. 
one of my favorite scenes was at the very beginning when the team went over to India and they're hearing the people chanting the sound, the the sound that they ended up conveying near the end of the film. And Jimmy's clapping in the back like, yeah, yeah, Christina, good job. Yes, yeah, so this, this scene was really, really profound, not only because of so many people using this tune as a mantra, but my mind went straight to if this has happened before, which it might have, people depicted them as gods. Where did, he, where did Spielberg get this idea from? Did this actually happen? Was this an inc- was this a, an event that happened and it got over Spielberg? Did this come from Jacques Vallée? You know, where did this information come from? And the telling part about this, because you hear the crowds and, the, you know, they pull up and over the hill. Uh, 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 all right. And then you hear the thing and it's going on and they're walking through and 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 uh, it's Bob Babylon and and Francis. And uh, and he says in French and then he turns around and, and, and asks the the guru, uh, where 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 are you getting this from? And he, the guru, turns around and yells out to the crowd um, in what, what language? Is it Hindu? Hindi. 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 Hindu. Yeah, Hindu is the Hindi. religion. Hindi. Yeah, yeah right. I apologize, uh, to everybody, for, for uh, this is live. This isn't taped. It's not Memorax. And he asked him, what, where? And the whole crowd points to the stars. Right? That's such a powerful moment. Powerful. Powerful. So good. Hey, do you remember the song? Uh, 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 what, 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 uh, 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 Jimmy, you've oh. seen it a thousand times. <laughs> Come on. I've, here's a bird flying. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And then you can just. <laughs> but, but. But this, there were so many profound scenes uh, in this in this two hour and fifteen minute film. But this one, I was just like, they didn't have to add this, but I'm really glad that they did. Uh, unfortunately, it was only kind of like touched on and it wasn't revisited. But the tune was consistent throughout the entire movie, from here to Barry playing it on the xylophone for children right 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 to 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 humming it and then to playing it near the end of the film it was consistent and it's those levels of consistencies that we as the audience know it has a level of significance and we want to get those answers by the very end of the film otherwise it feels like an unfulfilling film Luckily, Spielberg knew this and he says, okay, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to give the audience an answer and it turns out it was a form of communication. What, what were they saying? We don't know, but through at the end, it was conveying that, that this was a very peaceful level of communication. It wasn't hostile, it wasn't fearful. People weren't scared. They were intrigued, they were interested and they felt safe so much so that Roy voluntarily, went on the ship himself he didn't have to he was chosen yes but he didn't have to go but because of this level of confidence that these beings had given him and the answers that he wanted he went ahead and he walked up that little ramp by himself now he gets his uniform they give him the sunglasses remember yeah, i do he, he gets his suit snazzy. yeah he gets it yeah yeah he gets it he gets his little thing on um, I have uh, both of my scenes uh, involve Barry, my two favorite scenes. Um, and it, it's the first one is is, is kind of weird, but I'm just look, it's how my brain works. Nobody's in the scene. My favorite scene is the monkey with the symbols. King, 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 king. When he comes alive. Man, I still jump. I still jump. I still jump. And th- those toy monkeys they ain't in my house. Oh no, 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 no! Brilliant is a brilliant scene, and and uh, I, I I I go back and I think about the first time everybody in the theater freaked. That right? That that scene. Now, that, that, okay, so there's that. I, I, I know it's it's small, 
But I think it's a brilliant, brilliant part. But my favorite scene, though, is the close-up of Barry's face when he smiles at the aliens. You don't even at the see beginning. The aliens. Yeah, you don't see. Yeah, you don't see the aliens. You know the story behind that on how they uh, made Barry smile. Oh well, okay, okay, oh, uh, man. Go ahead, ruin it for me. But anyway, okay. so but <laughs> it's the glowing of his eyes and the wonder on his face and the smile, and but you don't see the alien. That's a great. That's 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 just great cinema. That's great filmmaking. Okay, so how did Stephen pull that off? Go ahead. Okay, so what they did was that people that were you know maintaining the production, one of them wore a gorilla suit and was jumping around like a little. Shut up! Is that true? And that's now how the character Barry now was you're laughing. just making stuff up. No, you're just making no, stuff that's up. That's the story. Yeah, that's how they made Barry smile and laugh. A gorilla suit. Yeah. Ah, okay. Spielberg will do, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I love documentaries and I love documentaries about making films, right? Documentaries of documentaries. Nice. And, and the uh, Spielberg, when he is with his child actors and, and I've seen the outtakes and the behind the scenes stuff from E.T. and, and uh, you know the all oh, the, the early stuff with Drew Barrymore and and Close Encounters and and stuff, where he's talking to these kids, right? The camera's right here, right? Cameron's right next to him. The kids in front of him. You know the scene that is about to go down is about to win an Academy Award, but you're watching, you know, the process of getting this done, and I, and and Steve, uh, it I. It, I think that he's still a child. He still thinks, you know what I mean? He's brilliant. He's an adult, but that's not what I mean. He's still a child at heart, and he knows how to communicate uh, with 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 children. To get somebody um, that is five years old, four years old, five years old, six years old, to an emotional place, where they need to freak out, they need to scream, they need to break down, they need to cry, they need to laugh. To get a child to do that, wow, right? And and Stephen pulled that off. But in this case, it was a gorilla suit. It wasn't Stephen going. Okay, now you're looking at your first birthday cake. Or, you know, whatever it is. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, But that scene. That scene with Barry, with the glow on his face and how happy he is, and that smile, and 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 you don't get to see the ET. You know that brilliant scene. It's my favorite scene. Never gets old. And, and oh, there's one. Okay, can I say? Oh, I'm looking at the clock. We're out of time. There are two little catch scenes in this. One when Barry is looking through the screen door. A fly comes in and lands on the screen door. In a normal situation, the, the scene is shot too perfect, right? In a normal situation, if it was Stanley Kubrick or some other first-time film, but cut, 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 retake, oh, there's a fly. You know, there's a fly. Check the gates. The gates, they, we, we got a fly. We're going to reshoot it, right? Not Spielberg. No, that fly... Lands on the screen, and and it, it's it, it's a weird, but but the the scene itself was correct, and that's the one that they used. So watch that, and in a couple of other scenes, you see shooting stars in the background, and uh, I think that's unintentional. Um, uh, it, it just happened to be the magic of the moment, and and I love that part too, uh, as well in in the film. I I've never heard. Um, there's like three or four Spielberg movies, uh, quote me here, where that magic happens in the background. It happens in Jaws, right? In Jaws, they're sitting on the boat and in the night sky and they're having this conversation and you see it in the background. Shooting stars as in plural just go by. So I don't think Spielberg is adding that stuff. That would really break my heart. So there you go. Yeah, brilliant film. And like I said, 
Uh, I'll wrap with this, and then I'll catch everybody tonight. We have Kim Carlsberg on the show tonight, by the way. Um, Lifetime of Contact, very famous photographer. So Kim Carlsberg, remember the TV series Baywatch? No. Really? Are you going to say no? Nod your head no again. Unreal. Okay, everybody, keep your comments down. We we understand. Okay. Baywatch. Baywatch was uh, the number one TV series in America for about 10 years. Number one, period. Um, Pamela Anderson, David Hasselhoff. I, I mean, I was like, uh, was it David? It was David. Huh? Anyway, um, Pam Anderson wearing the red, she was a lifeguard, the red lifeguard swimsuit running up the beach. All those famous photographs, all that stuff. That was Kim Carlsberg. She was the photographer, staff photographer on set for Baywatch. I, I only know five Hasselhoff years. from the SpongeBob movie. Thank you, Jimmy, so last, much this, for this doing this. This is the last show we me. do. This is it. This is the last one. It was great co-hosting with you, Christina, over the years. Thank you so much. This is my last show. The I'll see everybody tonight. <laughs> You guys later. Christina, thank you so much. Brilliant, brilliant show. Thank you so much. I'll thank see you, you everybody. Bye. Another great show. They're always <laughs> they're always something interesting. Before you head out, please answer the poll that is on YouTube if you are watching this live. And the question is: was close encounters of the third kind a major influence on your interest in the UFO topic? 29% yes, it started my interest. 31% said yes, brought validity to my interest. 10% say no, I haven't seen it yet. And 30% say no, just good entertainment. And that is from 476 votes thus far. So go ahead and do that before we wrap up today. Also, I have a new show on Tuesdays called Tales of the Strange and Unexplained. The first show was just this Tuesday got some really great feedback and people are saying it really helps them sleep because it is a story time type format of a show and you know what I am all for that if I can help you fall asleep that is a compliment like no other why because I have insomnia and I'll put anything to put me to sleep does it work no not that often but if I can help you that is a blessing right then and there. Tomorrow is Strange News at 3 p.m. PST, where I'll be covering all the strange news and mysterious headlines from around the world. You don't want to miss that show. So make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can watch it live. If you want to continue this conversation, bring it over to the Discord server with 2,000 other like-minded members. Share your thoughts, your insights, your experiences, and more. I know one of my amazing moderators will share that link in the live chat for you to join. Also, follow me on Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies for all of my updates and news and then also take a look at my instagram at strange paradigms where i share pictures and short videos for you but that is it for today i will see all of you tomorrow be safe and remember keep your eyes on the skies